morning, everybody, and let me thank you for having me this morning. Um, it was certainly my pleasure to be here. Um, I think I've been here before at your conference, and certainly it's my pleasure to speak on sleep disorders. Um, so we're going to be looking at sleep. I'm going to try to just simply outline what is normal sleep versus ideal sleep. I'm going to speak a bit about insomnia, which is a big problem and which is perhaps the main aspect of our talk. And then I'm going to go a bit into sleep apnea and we close off there. Now, normal sleep can be divided into so-called non-REM and REM sleep. Non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement sleep. And non-REM sleep is divided into essentially four stages. Stages one, two, three, and four. Stage one sleep, the commonest way of, this, this, of explaining it, essentially, is that stage one sleep is what some of you actually have now. You're looking at me, your eyes are open, and nothing is registering. <laughs> so it's not uncommon to find that people say they don't sleep at all, but they're actually sleeping. So stage one sleep, nothing is registering, your eyes are open, and you're, it's like you're in a daze. Stage two sleep is essentially when your eyes start to get droopy. So you're still sitting up, you're still looking at the person, and then the eyelids slowly start to come down. Stage three and four is, is deeper sleep, and this is so-called slow-wave sleep. And this is a sleep where you begin to lose muscle tone. So if you're sitting, your head may nod. <laughs> the pen may fall from your hand. The glasses may drop out of your hand. You begin to lose tone. And stages three and four sleep are deep sleep, which is the sleep that gives you that refreshing revitalization that when you wake up in the morning, you feel rested. REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, is also a very important sleep. Again, there is pretty good muscle relaxation during this period, and most persons require good stages three and four sleep and REM sleep to wake up in the morning feeling refreshed. So stages one and two sleep are really the introductory aspects of sleep. They're pretty early. Some of you will actually have it here today. And stages three, four, and REM sleep you'll probably get tonight when you go to bed. Now, one of the common questions that I get asked is how much sleep is normal? And that is really a difficult question because the answer is we don't know. On average, most persons sleep for somewhere between six to eight hours in terms of that's the amount of sleep that they need. Some persons actually need less sleep than that. And there are persons who need far more. They need up to 10 hours of sleep each night to feel rested. The ideal aspect of sleep is that when you go to bed, you should sleep through the night until you're awake in the morning. The ideal aspect of sleep is that when you're awake in the morning, you should feel rested and ready to take on the world. You should be able to function throughout the day without feeling tired, without feeling you need a little sleep or a little nap. And that should take you through until the next sleep cycle in the night. If you're accomplishing that, then you're getting good sleep. That is, you sleep through the night, you wake up feeling refreshed, and you can go through the entire day without needing any rest. If you're doing that, then you're doing fine. Now, insomnia is defined as a difficulty in initiating or maintaining sleep. And it can manifest itself in many ways. So examples are the person may go to sleep and they toss and turn for an hour, two hours before, they have, before they're able to fall asleep. Alternatively, they may fall asleep quite readily, but then they wake up, they keep waking up in the night. Alternatively, they may fall asleep well, they wake up in the night, but they are able to get back to sleep quite easily. Or they may wake up in the night, can't go back to sleep. Or they may sleep for several hours, so they may sleep for maybe four hours, and they wake up very early in the morning, four o'clock, and can't go back to sleep. So it manifests itself in a number of ways, but, initial, but essentially what it is, is a difficulty in initiating sleep, either at the beginning or when you wake up, 
or in maintaining sleep. That is to keep yourself asleep for a sustained period without having to wake up. The result of it is that you get up in the morning and you wish the night had not yet passed, that you had more time to sleep. And you don't feel energetic. You may feel sleepy throughout the day. If nothing major is happening, you may actually fall asleep. Stages one and two in many cases. And if you get a better opportunity, you may go into stages three and four. But basically, you don't have enough energy to take you through the day. And so you end up feeling tired or you fight sleep throughout the entire day. And that's essentially what happens. Right, insomnia can be classified into so-called primary and secondary insomnia. The vast majority of people really have secondary insomnia. That is, there is some other condition interfering with their sleep. Primary insomnia is less common, meaning when we evaluate the patient, we go through everything, we can't find anything primarily wrong, and what they really have is a true sleep disorder. We can also classify insomnia based on how long it's going on into acute and chronic. So chronic insomnia will be patients who have re repeated episodes of difficulty sleeping for more than three nights per week when it's, and going on for more than a month. The impact of insomnia is variable and it can be classified depending on how much impact it has on the person's personal life. So mild insomnia is considered where although the person has a bit of insomnia, it does not interfere with their everyday activity. Their social life, their occupation goes, goes on normally without any significant impact. For patients who have moderate insomnia, it begins to have an impact on them. Their performance may be affected. And in fact, if you're looking at, for example, children, they, their, their school performance may fall off. And it's actually a big problem that we need to look at where children are not getting enough sleep. And so their school performance is badly affected. Some of it, of course, I suppose an example would be like secondary insomnia where patients, persons live outside of Kingston and in order to get into Kingston, they have to get up from 4 o'clock in the morning to try to get, um, get, enough, get enough time to get through the traffic to get into Kingston. And so you find children don't perform well or in terms of adults, they don't, they don't function well at work. In severe insomnia, the symptoms are clearly much more severe. Patients fall asleep at work, they may lose their job, they may be have motor vehicle accidents, they may have industrial accidents, they may take other people's lives on the road. So this is a much more severe situation. Now, in terms of the causes, and that is what we're looking at, secondary insomnia, there are many, 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 many causes of secondary insomnia. In fact, we could spend all day here and go in tomorrow and still talking about secondary causes of insomnia. We could have a conference with orthopedic surgeons consultants, physicians, cardiologists, pharmacists, dentists, and still be talking about causes of insomnia because the causes of insomnia are extensive, okay? But I'm going to classify them into the following groups, health problems, environmental conditions, medications, and other situations. Now, many of the health problems that contribute to the person's um, having difficulty with sleeping relate to underlying medical issues. And so it's very important when a person comes to me with insomnia, we spend a lot of time taking a history. Sometimes persons can't figure out why we're getting into all of that, but the reality is there are many causes for insomnia. So I've listed a few here. So persons may have cardiac disease, and I'm just going to go through a few of them just to highlight the point. So for example, if a person has cardiac failure, when a person has cardiac failure, there is fluid backing up in the lungs and this always gets worse when they're lying down. So when the person is up and about, they may manage okay, but when they lie down to sleep, fluid backs up in the lung, they get short of breath, they get, the oxygen level goes low and then they wake up in the night. So they may have to sleep sitting up, they may have to sleep on extra pillows. So cardiac failure is an example of patients who may have cause insomnia. Nocturnal angina, so this is patients who have angina, like angina, 
pectory, sorry, ischemic heart disease, in some persons, the angina is worse at night. So they wake up with chest pains. And so again, they have difficulty sleeping and difficulty lying down. Patients with lung conditions, let's take ex asthma. Asthma is extremely common in our population. Roughly one in, one in five a person will have asthma, 20%. So a lot of you here have asthma. And uh, asthma has a propensity to be worse at night. Worse at night, manifesting itself as coughing, shortness of breath, increased exacerbations, including wheezing. So a lot of asthmatics may also come complaining of insomnia. And it's not until you get into their history that you realize that the problem they're having is inadequately controlled asthma, which needs to be treated. GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Again, acid reflux can present with, with um, insomnia, difficulty sleeping. Musculoskeletal problems, people have back pain, neck pain, joint pains. They just can't find a good position in the bed to sleep because they're just uncomfortable. And again, it can be another cause of pain. And in fact, any pain disorder that they have, whether it is headache, whether it is sinusitis, all of this can lead to difficulty sleeping at night. Endocrine problems, thyrotoxicosis, the hyperactivity associated with hyperthyroidism may make it difficult for persons to sleep. Persons with diabetes may pass a lot of urine at night. They may have um, diabetic neuropathy. So they may have burning and tingling and sticking pains in the nights that prevents them from sleeping. And so they may come with insomnia, but the problem is really a diabetic neuropathy, which if adequately treated, will help them to get sleep. Prostate problems that men can have, a common problem with prostate is that as it gets larger, persons tend to have increased frequency, and one of the manifestations of that is nocturia. They wake up in the night, pass urine several times. And again, that can contribute to insomnia. Um, we mentioned neurological conditions, patients with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. But outside of the obvious physical conditions, one of the commonest, commonest causes of, of insomnia is really some kind of psychiatric, what I'm going to classify as psychiatric problem. Um, not necessarily a, a full psychiatric disease, but anxiety perhaps is the most common. So you have anxiety, depression, grief. Persons are concerned about their, their jobs. Um, Mr. Christian is here. When, when Caramed is expanding, people begin to wonder if they're going to lose their job. When technology comes in, people wonder if their jobs are going to be at, at risk. Um, people worry about their, 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 their personal life. They may be having problems with their spouses. They may be having problems with their children. Children not doing so well in school. Children turning to drugs. Uh, they may be worried about what's happening in the, in the economy. Are they going to be able to, to, to purchase a home? What's happening to their car? These are some of the commonest reasons why persons have difficulty. And some of the big, big problems that persons have with, with anxiety are really... <laughs> I'm not troubling you, Mr. Christian. I'm sure you, <laughs> I'm sure you look out for your staff very, very well. <laughs> Um, but um, the biggest contributors to, to anxiety disorders are interpersonal relationships. So you'd be surprised how sometimes people have a tremendous fear when they have to face a new day and they have a boss that they just cannot work with. You know? um, the next one is interpersonal relationships in the family. So spouses, children, that kind of thing. Those are big areas of problems. Jobs, I mean, that's how you found yourself. So if your job is not doing well, if you're not earning enough from your job, if you are not satisfied with your income, if you're worried about job security, these are all things that can keep you up at night. And, um, of course, religion. Persons have problems with, they have conflicts with religion in terms of maybe how they interact with a spouse and one spouse might be a Christian, for example, and one is a non-Christian. Maybe one denomination versus another denomination. So these are all common conflicts that keep people up at night. And many times when persons come to me and they tell me they can't sleep at night, they wake up 3 o'clock in the morning and they can't sleep, the first thing I'll ask them is, what's on your mind when you wake up? 
because oftentimes it's what is on their mind that keeps them up at night. The other thing that can keep people awake, and this is where government comes in, is noise. Noise in the home. So if you, have, uh, if you live in a certain area, if you live near to the national stadium, and football matches are going on and there's noise, and uh, things like that, certainly that can keep you up. Your neighbor is having a party. Lighting inside and outside can also be an important part. Some people like to sleep when it's completely dark. Some people must have a little light. Some people have to have bright lights. So these are all things that you have to go into. And of course, temperature. If your time is too hot, you can't sleep. If your time is too cold, you can't sleep. So these are all things to look at. Pharmacies, of course, you have a role to play. Let me try and keep you awake. Get out of stage one and two and look at me carefully. You have <laughs> there are medications that you have to talk to patients about because some of these medications can keep your patients asleep. Over-the-counter drugs, for example, common things like colon sinus medications almost always have some kind of um, vasoconstrictor stimulant in it that can keep your patient awake and prevent them from sleeping at night. So you may have to talk to them about that. Supplements are other things that keep people awake. Some of them have stimulants in them that help. They tell you they give you energy, but they prevent you from sleeping at night. Um, other contributing factors include the flexi work week. We think the flexi work is a modern work week, but the reality is it wasn't how God created us. So you have persons, when they go on night shift, it completely messes up their life. I remember one nurse I had, I eventually she begged me to write a letter for her to tell the sister in charge that she cannot do night shifts because whenever she goes on night shifts, she can't sleep. She does not sleep in the day and then she's on shift at night. I mean, her situation was really bad. It went on for years and I eventually wrote the letter. Flexi works, as we said, jet lag, of course, can also contribute. So some of the common things that you have to ask yourself, and this is some of the things that insomnia is, are you tired in the day? Are you having tiredness? Are you yawning and feeling sleepy? Is there a lack of energy? Are you having headache, especially frontal headaches? You have difficulty with concentration. You have difficulty with memory. You can't remember things. You think you're getting old, but you're just not getting enough sleep. You're irritable. You're no longer the nice guy or lady, but you're just constantly irritable. And of course, loss of libido. Other general medical conditions I mentioned that may contribute obesity, diabetes, hypertension, depression, drug abuse, heart attack, stroke, these are all other contributing factors. So when a patient comes to me saying that they can't sleep, I have to go into the history. History in terms of everything, um, all their medical issues, all their social issues, sometimes all of their financial issues, all their religious issues, until we, can, until we can figure out which one is contributing. We have to do a physical examination because sometimes there are some obvious things. Persons may have, for example, scoliosis or a twisting of the spine that's making it difficult for them to sleep. There are some blood tests that we routinely do if you have kidney failure, for example, which may not be obvious until you develop insomnia. Um, that may, may not show up. Um, we look for heart conditions, we look for lung conditions, so that may include ECGs, chest X-rays, lung function testing. And uh, of course, if we can not identify anything specific, we may go to a polysomnogram, which is a, a full sleep study. The treatment of insomnia essentially is to treat the problem. So if you can identify the primary cause of insomnia, then you treat it. If the patient has asthma that's not controlled, then we treat that. If they have heart disease that's not controlled, then we treat that. Um, if they're having you know, various problems, so they're taking a, a sinus medicine at night, it's keeping them awake. They're eating late at night and having GERD. They're drinking lots of fluids. In fact, I had a patient who came and she was having difficulty sleeping. And she believed in this eight glasses of water per day. And I'm sure most of you do, which I don't. <laughs> and the problem she was having is she was getting up five and six times in the night to pass urine. So she comes to me complaining of tiredness and she wants to know if she has sleep apnea. 
Well, we checked her out. She didn't have sleep apnea. She just drank too much water. <laughs> and once we got her to cut down on the water intake, she was fine. So you really have to go through. Pharmacological therapy is always a last resort. As you know, many of the drugs are addictive, including the benzodiazepines. And so we always go through and try and find some method of controlling the patients without drugs. So we look at things like sleep time. Do they have a set time to go to sleep? This is uh, for persons who have no difficulty in sleeping, you can go to bed anytime you want. For people who have difficulty sleeping, we recommend that you try and have a, a fixed sleep time if possible. Do a sleep preparation. Tell your body, I'm preparing you to go to bed. Get the environment right. Lighting right for whatever is good for you. Sound is right for whatever is good for you. Some, I had a patient who we brought in for a sleep study, and she insisted on watching the television. I said, um, you know, ma'am, the reality is we bring you in for a sleep test. We want you to sleep. She said, listen, doc, if I don't watch the TV, I'll never sleep tonight. So we turned on the TV, she fell asleep, and we were able to do the sleep study. So for her, watching television helped her to sleep. For others, sometimes it's reading a book. Some people, once they watch the television, they'll never sleep because the show is so interesting that they keep watching it until way into the morning period, and then they wake up tired. So it's difficult, it's different for everybody. Eating before you go to bed, not so good, you can get reflux. Drinking before you go to bed, we say waking up to pass urine. Lighting, sound, all of these things are important. Now, your pharmacist and some medications are also useful. And I, I, I mentioned here both direct and indirect. So sometimes we use indirect method of treating patients. So sometimes I have a patient who is having difficulty sleeping and they need a drug to treat a condition. So in that case, I may choose a drug whose side effect is drowsiness and I may give them the drug at night. Doesn't always work, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but that's one way of treating it. So somebody, for example, with diabetic neuropathy, who may be going on Lyrica, or gabapentin, or amitriptyline, these are all drugs whose side effects are drowsiness. So sometimes we'll use that, let the patient take it at night, and sometimes it works. It takes away the symptoms and it helps them to sleep. Okay, so that's some of the ways we may work. If all of that fails, then we go back to our traditional drugs. But as I said, drugs, medications are a last resort. The person, for example, has sinusitis, we may give them DPH at night to help them with it. You know, so you can work around sometimes. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep apnea um, because it's a one of the conditions associated with sleeping, and many of the symptoms of insomnia are tied up with sleep apnea to some extent. So it's a sleep disorder characterized by episodes of hypopneas and, and apneas, with episodes of low oxygen, and episodes where your carbon dioxide may go up. So in terms of definition, we call a hypopnea, a period during sleep when breathing is reduced by about 30% or more, and we call an apnea basically where breathing stops. And apneas can either be obstructive, meaning there's a blockage in the throat, or they may be central, where there's a reduced drive to breathe. And in most cases, when we just use the word sleep apnea, we're really talking about obstructive sleep apneas. And then you'll see us talk about an apnea hypopnea index. This is the number of times one of these episodes would occur within one hour. And these are often associated with low oxygen levels. <clears throat> now, sleep apnea is characterized by a combination of these. We do accept that patients who sleep may have periods of reduced breathing and that it can be considered normal, provided it doesn't occur for more than a certain number of times. Now, the, the problem with sleep apnea is that these episodes, when they occur, are associated with other things. They're associated with a reduction in the stages that we said of sleep that we're like, likely to get, which are the stages three and four sleep. So that's the sleep that makes you feel refreshed. So if you sleep, if you, if you sat there all day looking at me and you fell asleep, 
stages one and two, you still don't feel rested. You still feel tired. You still want to sleep. So that doesn't really give you much in terms of sleep. But when you get into stages three and four sleep and REM sleep, that's when your body is fully relaxed. And that's the time when most obstructions occur. When they do occur, they create an arousal, which is a move from a deeper stage of sleep to a lighter stage of sleep, and it causes the release of chemicals during these periods. These include cortisol, adrenaline, and thyroxine. And if you think about you releasing increased amount of cortisol and thyroxine and adrenaline every single night when you're sleeping, then you can look at some of the complications that can arise as a result of that. Too much of these hormones are clearly bad for you. So there is excessive daytime sleepiness, poor school performance, reduced work output, increased risk of accidents, impaired memory, increased risk of hypertension, heart attack, and stroke. And these risks are increased several fold. So for example, um, someone with sleep apnea has about a three to four times risk of getting a heart attack than someone who doesn't, and similarly, a stroke. Some complications are not as obvious, and these include, for example, left ventricle hypertrophy. So the Heart Foundation screens regularly for persons who have heart disease, and um, one of the things they screen for is um, left ventricle hypertrophy. And it's not uncommon when we read these ECGs for Heart Foundation, we find people who have left ventricle hypertrophy, and, uh, which is thickening of the heart, sorry, and they have no risk factor, so they're not, they don't have high blood pressure. And they come to you and say, Doc, I don't understand. I go to Heart Foundation for screening. They tell me I have, my heart is bad and I don't trouble with hypertension. Well, sometimes if you have sleep apnea, you can develop left ventricular hypertrophy, although your blood pressure in the daytime is normal. You can develop cardiac arrhythmias, and we think it's some of the cause why patients die in the early morning period. There's definitely an increased risk of death. Other things that may occur in patients with sleep apnea, they may have too much red blood cells, polycythemia. They may get up at night to pass urine frequently. So yes, you may pass urine frequently because you have a prostate problem. Yes, you may pass urine frequently because you drink too much water. But you may also pass urine frequently simply because you have sleep apnea. And then there are, another, there are a list of other situations that may occur. So sleep apnea is diagnosed like all other conditions by going through the history, physical examination, and doing the appropriate tests. Um, and the history, of course, is most of the things we mentioned before. Just to add a few highlights, common things why people come for sleep testing is that they snore and they disturb a bed partner. Although snoring is strongly associated with sleep apnea, the vast majority of people who snore do not have sleep apnea. They are simply snorers. Certainly, if you have so-called witness apneas, if you're seeing the person choking, can't breathe when they're sleeping, then that's strong evidence that they probably do have apneas, and we do recommend strongly that those patients proceed with sleep apnea testing uh, or with polysomnography. Other conditions include um, some of the ones I mentioned already, even memory impairment, especially in, in a younger type person, stroke in the young, poor school performance. These are all things that require evaluation for sleep. Many of the patients who have sleep apnea will have obesity, but the first patient we tested in 1999 was actually self-referred because he could not find a doctor to refer him for sleep apnea. The, everybody he went, he was convinced he had it, he had a family history of it, but everybody he went to told him he was too slim to have sleep apnea. <laughs> when we did the study, he had quite severe sleep apnea. And um, just to highlight that sleep apnea is not necessarily related to weight. Similarly, we have patients who come to us and they're very obese. And the family member tell them to go and test yourself for sleep apnea because you must have sleep apnea. Look how you eat and get fat. And they don't have sleep apnea. They're just obese. <laughs> so although there's a correlation, obese, most, pieces, most persons who are obese do not have sleep apnea, and you can be quite slim and have very severe sleep apnea. Um, when we examine the patients, we look for the changes in the back of the throat. One of the contributing conditions to poor dentition 
And when I speak to dentists, I highlight that it's also sleep apnea because sleep apnea increases the risk of acid reflux, which can lead to damage to the teeth. And so patients sometimes will present with poor dentition because they actually have sleep apnea. Again, I'm predominantly talking about obstructive sleep apnea here. So most of the obstruction occurs at the back of the pharynx where um, either the tongue or other parts of the body may protrude and interrupt um, breathing while you're asleep. So the confirmatory test for most sleep disorders that includes sleep apnea includes patients who have insomnia where no obvious cause can be found is a polysomnogram. And a polysomnogram means that we monitor the patient during sleep and we monitor a number of parameters so we can tell what's happening. So we monitor the EEG or electrocardiogram, electroencephalogram, so we can tell the EEG is what tells us along with the EOG, electrooculogram and EMG, what stages of sleep you're in, whether you're in stages one, two, three, four, or whether you're in REM sleep. We monitor airflow through the nostrils and mouth. We monitor the heart for cardiac arrhythmias. We monitor oxygen in the blood. We monitor carbon dioxide in the blood. We monitor the chest, the abdomen, the legs, body positioning. We check for snoring. In our setting, we don't routinely do video recording of sleep, but we do it in special situations because we do have some patients who have bizarre sleeping disorders where they do funny things in their sleep. They may jump up, they may walk, they may talk, they may do all kinds of stuff. So for patients who give a history of that, we do videoing for, for when they're sleeping. And then, of course, if they do have sleep apnea, we do a titration test using CPAP or BiPAP. The sleep study would be able to confirm the diagnosis whether they do have a primary sleep disorder um, to determine the severity of the disorder, to determine if there are complications associated with the disorder like arrhythmias or if they're having breathing problems associated with the disorder, and to determine in the cases where assisted breathing is needed, that is what we call continuous positive airway pressure, if that, that CPAP, if that requires what adjusted pressure is needed. Um, we can also evaluate persons to determine if they have narcolepsy. And when we do sleep studies, we always do a clinical evaluation before because, for example, persons who have narcolepsy, you have to do the sleep study in a particular way to determine if, they're actually, if they actually have narcolepsy. So you have to already suspect the condition in most cases to adequately de detect it. So just to give you some definitions, so we said the apnea hypopnea index is the number of times the things occur in an hour. So if it occurs for less than five, so if you have a few episodes, two or three episodes per hour, we consider that normal. If it's more than five, it's abnormal. Five to 15 is mild, 15 to 30, moderate, and greater than 30, severe. We also monitor patients to see if their carbon dioxide levels are normal when they're asleep. Remember, there are two gases in the blood, oxygen and carbon dioxide. For patients who have sleep, sleep apnea, the treatment options include CPAP, which I've mentioned, surgery, which is often done by the ENT surgeons, or dental prosthesis, which is done by dentists, where they put um, basically devices in the mouth that try to pull the jaw forward when you're sleeping. So some of the medical conditions associated with sleep apnea include cardiovascular disease, stroke and hypertension, heart attacks, diabetes, and uh, cardiac arrhythmias. This is just, um, well, giving you an example. This is a, our laptop that we use for sleep. We use a wireless transmission. Um, this is a CPAP machine that we use for titration. This is a tracing that we have from a patient who had a sleep study. And basically, this patient had apneas, which are points where that, that tracing and you're looking at, where it gets flat. So that's when the breathing stops. So the tracing reflects the breathing. When it stops, it goes flat. And then you'll see, if you look at the, the ECG tracing, you'll see some abnormal beats occurring after the person stops breathing. So this patient actually had arrhythmias, which occurred during sleep, 
the arrhythmias occur at the periods when they have their apneas. And once we treated this patient, then these arrhythmias actually disappeared completely during sleep. So this is a picture of a patient who is lined up for sleep study. And with the monitors that we just mentioned before, the one on the scalp are the, and the face are to the... Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, <laughs> it looks odd, yes. So when we take people for sleep... So to summarize, insomnia is a common sleep disorder. It's perhaps the most common sleep disorder. I mentioned to you that you have both primary and secondary insomnia, and the most common form of insomnia is secondary insomnia caused by some other underlying problem. And in my experience, most of the problems are perhaps related to anxiety disorders. The diagnosis involves taking a history, physical examination, doing a sleep test where indicated, and to treat the patient as much as possible with non-pharmacological um, methods, but there are times when pharmacological methods may be required, and as I pointed out, one can use sometimes, if the patient already has an underlying condition, one can use that condition to an advantage in a sense to use drugs that may help the person with sleeping, or if you can't find that, then you may have to go to your direct and usual sleep aids. Thank you. Are there any questions? The question is, as it relates to patients who need CPAP for sleep apnea, and uh, um, are there any adjustments that may be required? So once we diagnose sleep apnea and the patient requires CPAP and accepts it, we strongly recommend that the patient comes back in about three to four weeks initially for a reassessment to confirm that they are satisfied that it's addressing all the problems of their sleeping and that they're comfortable sure with the machine. First. Thereafter, once they're satisfied, we review them once every six months. And um, usually, from my experience, the, the machines last forever. What happens sometimes is that the mask may leak. So we may need to change the mask after about two years. Sometimes the straps need to be changed because they're not tight as possible. Um, and we do recommend that the patient comes in roughly once every six months so we can reevaluate them to see that they are still sleeping properly, that the machine is working adequately, that there is no need for adjustment because remember it's a titration we use and the pressures may, have, may need to be changed to match a change in their condition, which may be that they have gained weight over the last year or that they may have lost weight. Department agency, we have some professors who taught us and Benzodiazepines, when given for more than 14 consecutive nights, would cause rebound insomnia. Has there been any changes on that? Or, or is, I'm not, I notice that most prescriptions don't follow that. So the benzodiazepines are the best sleep aids available <laughs> in terms of drugs. They work well, they are highly predictable, and they are almost guaranteed to make a person sleep. The big problem with them is, of course, is one addiction where after using it for a sustained period, usually for a few weeks, then the patient may, one, have difficulty going off to sleep if, if they come off the drug and may eventually develop, again, insomnia because they now can't sleep without the sleep aid. So yes, it's, it's still a fact. Um, what we try to do, as we said, is to minimize the use of drugs in sleep disorders, but where necessary, where it's necessary, we try to use sometimes drugs that don't have the addictive property. The problem we have, as I said, is that the benzodiazepines are actually the best sleep aids. Sometimes we can use them in a form of what we call recycling. So for example, you'll have somebody who went on nights, who went to um, one of these, let's suppose these um, night shows. So they were out two nights because they had some Body from overseas come by and was singing and they liked the music so they went out. So they had two nights when they had disruptive sleep and then they find thereafter they're just unable to sleep. In situations like that we sometimes can recycle them. We let them take their benzodiazepines for a few nights, maybe three or four nights and then just withdraw it and they'll sleep well. But yes, you do have the addictive problem once they're on the benzodiazepine, usually for around three weeks or more. 
question. Information being presented about sleeping between the hours of 10 and 2. And this possibly could reverse some of the problems that we face. Are there any thoughts on it? <laughs> well, you have to de determine that man was made by God. And we are not animals that function at night. We are really animals that function in the day. But we have extended ourselves in a way that says that we can function at night. We are higher animals. We can do things that other animals can't do. So don't quite understand it, but there are some issues. It, it seems, I would say, the vast majority of persons do better if they sleep at night. So persons who go on night shift will always tell you that they don't sleep as well as when they're on day shift. And you see this a lot with nurses, because they're the ones that do night shifts. And they'll tell you that when they're on the night shift, they do sleep in the day, but they're not as rested as when they sleep at night. Some persons have critical points. So what's my critical point? My critical point, it seems from my experience, is 5 a.m. Well, I, those who know me know that I get up very early every morning when I go to work. But if I wake up between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the mornings, after a few days, I begin to feel tired. If I get up after 5 in the mornings, I have no problem. I can go through the day. And there are persons like that. My wife tells me her cutoff is 7. <laughs> so if she wakes up before 7 o'clock in the morning, her day is a wreck. Um, so there seems to be something about the hours and the, the sleeping, but a large aspect of sleep remains unexplored and ununderstood. So yes, there may be something critical about the timing itself, but I can't really say much more about that. Okay, guys, we have two more questions um, after this, one more after this one. Thank you. Dr. Scott, in your list of health problems that cause, contribute to insomnia, I noticed that menopause was, was not missing. Listed. Is there a reason for that? Because I'm a man. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I so was... I was almost offended yes, I realized. that menopause was not there. <laughs> yes, so you're quite right. Menopause is a contributing factor. The hormonal change can lead to insomnia. In fact, it's, it's quite funny because just in my office yesterday, a patient came and asked me the very question about menopause. It's nothing more than I'm a man. I forget some of these things. I'm so sorry. And secondly, mm -hmm. alcohol. How does alcohol fare in the list of drugs that can creates sleep, stage three to four sleep. Right, so alcohol is actually a sedative. So which is why most pharmacists will say, don't take this drug with alcohol because the drug is also can make you drowsy. Um, so alcohol can actually help you to sleep if you're having difficulty sleeping. We do not recommend it because of course it's addictive and one can become an alcoholic. Um, also for persons who have sleep apnea, um, although they tell you they keep waking up, if you give them drugs to make them sleep, it, they sleep, but it sleep apnea is worse. So they get lower oxygen readings in their sleep, their carbon dioxide levels may go higher, so they may actually develop more complications. So that's the problem with, with sleep apnea. Sedatives actually make it worse. Um, if they're on treatment, then you can give them a sedative. But if they're not treated, you shouldn't give them a sedative. So alcohol definitely makes you sleep. When I drink, you know, I like to leave myself as an example. When I drink alcohol and go to bed, I sleep. In fact, I can't wake up at five anymore. I have to set my alarm. <laughs> so it is a sedative, but we don't recommend that you use it as for that because of its addictive properties. Okay, Dr. Thank you very much for that presentation. In the cognitive effects. Where is your experience with patient bipolar? And secondly, in the treatment plan, where is the, let me call it, the ganja, the cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's a> big <laughs> 
Yeah, so certainly um, any kind of medical or psychiatric illness may contribute to sleep disorder. So, for example, patients who are bipolar, they may have periods when they are very, very agitated and energetic, and they'll get up in the middle of the night sometimes, and they'll work from 1 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the morning, having to go to work at 7. So it, it does affect their judgment in that way, and because of the, the swings, you know, last night they were filled with energy. Today they are without energy. They are in a depressed mood. So certainly any psychiatric illness can contribute. Many of the drugs we use to treat them can cause drowsiness and can affect them in that way also. So yes, and that's why it's important to go to the history because you have to go to the history to find out what's going on and what can be contributing to the person with a sleep disorder. The second part of your question was... Cannabis, yes, yes, how could I forget that? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, again, cannabis research is really just coming on stream now. Um, so one of the problems with, with cannabis is that there are a, a myriad of claims about it, um, but the research is really just not yet there. Certainly, <laughs> I can tell you stories. So there's not, this is not a randomized control study. Certainly we have patients who have medical conditions they said, Doc, I can't sleep. Would you, what do you recommend? I said, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, Doc, guess what? I used a little cannabis oil last night. And they sleep. With another patient, she had, um, she had a cancer. They used a the cannabis oil on her, and she slept. They called the next morning and said, Doc, I'm not sure if she's dead or alive. She, <laughs> the sleep was so deep <laughs> that they couldn't tell for sure whether she was you know, well, dead or alive. It turned out she was alive, just that she was in a very deep sleep. They, they got very afraid, and they never used it again. So certainly there is clearly, there clearly some benefit on it. Lots of room for research. Lots of room for big companies to do research. Um, but certainly um, not a lot of scientific evidence on, on cannabis at this point. Yes, morning. Um how long can a person go without sleep, without something really bad happening to them? <laughs> That's a good question. How long can a person go without sleep? Yeah, maybe I'm a storyteller. I had a patient who came to me just three weeks ago, and she said she has never slept. She hasn't slept for the last two years. <laughs> so I told her, you know, I tried my best, and I said to her, listen, if you don't sleep for two years, you'll be dead. <laughs> the answer is, I don't know exactly how long you can go without sleep. Um, studies suggest that you could probably go, nobody goes without sleep more than a few days. So that's the issue with stages one and two sleep. You sleep and you don't know. Um, so for example, this patient, when I, when I had a conversation with her husband, her husband tells me that, yes, doc, she, she keeps fall, she sleeps in the night, but she doesn't know. Um, but when you ask her, she says she had never slept for two She hasn't slept for two years. Are you tired in the morning when you wake up? She says, no. Are you sleepy in the daytime? No. Do you feel like you need to take a break in the day from your work? She says, no. But I just don't, I haven't slept for two years. After a long and discussion and tests, and we eventually did a sleep study on her, which was normal. She slept. Um, tried to convince her that her problem was anxiety, and she got very upset and, and walked out of the room. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can't go very long without sleep. Um, we don't quite understand sleep, so one of the arguments, for example, one of the theories behind Michael Jackson's death um, was actually lack of REM sleep, that he had a lot of sleep, but not enough REM sleep. And again, we don't fully understand. You do need some REM sleep to stay alive. And the theory is that he just missed out on REM sleep because of what they were using to make him sleep did not create REM sleep. It just created sleep. Um, I have no idea if that is true. Please do not quote me. <laughs> I have really no idea. But I don't think you can go longer than a few days without sleep. I don't think necessarily that... Um, you, 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 you know, I don't think you just drop dead because you haven't slept. A lot of times people sleep and they don't know. 
Many of you have probably fallen asleep during this talk, and you don't know because you're still sitting up. You miss a few words that I said, but you know, you're still sitting up. You just said maybe you didn't hear, but you really went off into sleep. So I don't know if I've answered your question fully, but that's, that's the best that we have right now. Um, Dr. Scott, I wanted to call, um, contribute to your answer on cannabis in psychiatric disorders. It is actually contraindicated. CBD, however, has good effects in um, anxiety. Thank you. Yes, and in fact, let me, let me, let me again, a story. I, I, I remember a friend, he had an exam, and he was so anxious, but he smoked a weed and this allowed him to be relaxed. He was relaxed, he went inside, he came back out and he said, boy, I can crush this exam. Well, he completely failed. <laughs> Miserably. But he was relaxed. So clearly, there's a lot more research that needs to be done to find out the different chemicals and how we use them. Dr. Scott, uh, as a sleep specialist, do you encounter cases related to sleep paralysis? And if so, what is the approach to treatment? The question is on sleep paralysis. So sleep paralysis are these periods when you are asleep or in a semi-quasi state of sleep, which is actually sleep, but you are sufficiently awake to have some degree of consciousness of what is around you and you feel like you can't move. The simplest example is, dopey hole you down. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, that's what it is called in local terms, right? Um, it, is, it is actually very common. Um, it is actually sleep. You actually think you're awake. Again, it's often good when, when you have experienced it. I have experienced it. And, um, but what you find is when you actually, when you finally come awake, you realize that the situation that you're in is not exactly the physical situation you're in, which is why it tells you that you're actually asleep, you're not awake. So it's a quasi-sleep situation where you are asleep but sufficiently light that you feel you are awake but your limbs don't move at all. Um, it's not life-threatening in any way. It is actually very disturbing when it happens, because as I said, I've ha it has happened to me on more than one occasion. Um, it oftentimes goes away on its own spontaneously. I didn't take anything for it. And um, in most cases, it's a matter of taking the person through and letting them understand it, because most times it doesn't require any, any physical treatment. When the person goes into deep sleep, they tend not to have it. But you see it sometimes when you're in that early sleep stage where the stage between being awake and being asleep is a very unstable state. And that's when you tend to get it. So I saw something online that said it may be better than um, instead of getting eight hours of sleep straight that you divide the sleep into two. Is that, do you have any experience of patients that say, or oh, they get more restful rest that way? Or is it better to just have one long sleep? Yeah. So the answer to that is we're not sure, but I think there's a variation in individuals. So one of the things that struck me is the long historic event of the siesta in the Spanish-speaking countries. They have for decades and hundreds of centuries had the concept that after you eat at lunchtime, you should go and sleep. We call it niggeritis. <laughs> so I think there is some benefit to it. Uh, I don't think it has been adequately researched, but I think for some individuals, it actually works very well. And they tell you that if they if they get that little nap, and it doesn't need to be long, sometimes half an hour, or in the afternoon, they are awake and they're filled with energy and they're ready to go again as if it was first in the morning. 
So, again, it's something I've noticed. I mean, as I said, the, the Latin American, the Spanish group, this is where the siesta comes in. And I mean, in some places, in in, it's not so common now because everybody has become uniform, English speaking, Spanish speaking, French. But in the, years ago, the, the Spanish countries used to shut down for a brief period in the afternoon. And then they would go on late at night in terms of opening hours. It's the English that really run the straight thing and then close off at like five to six. But the Spanish would take a break and then they have a longer opening hour. So there's certainly, I think, some benefit to it. I think it's, you know, it, it, you'll have to work out whether that is good for you or not. Um, I must say, I used to use it. Um, I, when I had more time, I used to go home and just take a half an hour or one hour nap in the half, like 12, one o'clock. Um, this was many years ago, when I had more time. And I used to feel very good about it. Um, but you can work out what's best for you. Okay, final question. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Professor. So my question is the Fitbit and the watch that you can use and you can measure your sleep in the night and it tells you remembrance, awake, deep sleep and, and benchmark for your age. How accurate are those devices? Can we use them or should we not? Well, I, I think, I mean, I can't hit technology. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of them being tested uh, um, in a very scientific way against standard sleep studies. Um, I think it's a useful screen to help you to determine if you're getting adequate sleep. So I think it's a useful tool that may give you some idea. It's not as clearly as not as accurate as a formal sleep study, but how close it is to that accuracy, I can't really say with any certainty. Thank you.